Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray that you want to take very serious. You should take all of God's words serious, of course, but um, these were the preparations that Christ put the disciples through before he sent them out to preach. Therefore, the 10th chapter of Matthew, every item, every note should be taught to be by any pastor to be pleasing to Messiah. It's just that simple. You'll never find or be able to get a better handle on what it is he would have you teach in your church. I don't care what shingle you fly or what flag you might have. If, if you claim to be a Christian, you should teach the doctrine of Christ. And what has he said to them up to this time in this preparation, just before he sent them out? He told them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. Naturally, that has been expanded at this time. And then he continued on. He said, you're going to be like a, a sheep among wolves out there. And he made it very clear that they should teach that they would be delivered up. And this goes future, before the second advent, before the synagogues of Satan and that they're not to premeditate what they'll say, but the Holy Spirit will speak through them at that time. We'll find a great deal more of that in the 24th chapter. And then he told them, he implied in the verses uh, 21 through 33, there, there is a controversy. There is a war between Satan and God. He said, think not that I am come to bring peace, but... I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter, and so forth. If they are following Satan, there it's war. Now, in this generation, all you do is plant a seed. And if, the, if they don't pick up on it, if God causes seed in the mind to grow. And remember, I told you when he said not to send peace, the word send in the Greek is like casting out seed okay, of truth, like he was sowing truth. And when we get into the 13th chapter, you'll hear a great deal more of that. But between th this war between Satan and our father, blood uh, relationships have nothing to do as to which side of the um, line that a person stands on. But you are to be wiser than the serpent. You don't uh, you don't make war necessarily in your own family. Don't discuss it if they can't accept it. But at, at the same time, don't cast God's pearls before swine. And that's not a statement of degradation. It's just a fact. So we came to the 37th uh, verse of this 10th chapter and when he meant, stated that a man's foes will, shall be those of his own household. That means those he associates with. And he said, don't think it's any great thing. I was persecuted when I walked the earth. My doctrine is persecuted, and if you teach it naturally, you shall be also. So, a word to the wise is sufficient. Let's pick it up in verse 37, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Think about that is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Why? He's the nearest relative you have. If you've seen the son, you've seen the father. He's the father of your very soul. Now, um, this is, um, as we were just discussing, this is a far better translation than you find in the 14th chapter of Luke where he said those that will not hate their father, mother, brother, sister. The word in the Greek means love less. And he did a good job on translating this. It means that 
Uh, and I want to say another word on that. This doesn't mean that if your wife doesn't believe exactly as you do, that you should leave her. It doesn't mean that at all. He's saying keep your priorities in order. For as Paul would later teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you stay with a mate that may not believe as you do, you set a good example, and who knows, maybe they'll come over to your way of thinking as long as they do not infringe upon your right to love Christ more. That is to say, follow him, believe him, know that he's a keeper of word. And if you want his blessings, you will have that loyalty to him. It does not mean that you must voice this to that mate, whereby they know what you're doing. You're to be wiser than serpent, the serpent that might speak by maneuvering with the love of God and knowing that you love Christ more, you know how to, how to handle those situations using common sense, of course. Verse 38, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now remember again, he had just mentioned the delivering up as he prepared them to go out and teach the people as to what would befall them and taking it all the way to this generation. What is your cross? What's a cross for? It's not a little trinket you wear around your neck. He's talking about a cross that you're crucified on. In other words, you'd better be willing to stick with the true uh, doctrine even to the death. Now, that's not that he expects anyone to die. We know the two witnesses will. But that's what a man, when, when you see a man uh, in, at this particular time of, of this writing carrying a cross, he was carrying his own cross to the place of execution. And so, and it put, it, it, it in a sense is a metaphor that you're going to teach his word and that way a little persecution doesn't seem too bad to you when you're willing to stick with that to the bitter end. Verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake, for my sake, shall find it. In other words, uh, what, what he's talking about here, if you find the old easy life in the world out here, you go ahead and saddle up with the enemy, you're going to lose your eternal rights and soul. In other words, as Esau, you'll be selling out your heritage. You'll be giving those precious things away for um, just to be a good old boy and buddy-buddy with everybody and, and uh, never be salty enough to make the water a little saltier in your atmosphere, wherever you are. A Christian is supposed to make a difference. And when you lose that easy-going life, then you find your soul for his sake eternal soul. Now understand what he's saying here. It's very simple and don't struggle with it. In other words, you have the you are one of his elect. You can practice the very truth and still set a very fine example in a community of honesty, uprightness, your word is good, your reputation is good, and, um, of course, you never let gossip interfere with what is fact. And, um, and still live a happy life, but you can't be buddy-buddy with Satan. You can't serve two masters. That's the point, all right? You either serve God or you serve Satan. Verse 40, he that receiveth you receiveth me. Now, again, I must remind you, he's sending them out to represent him. And when you take on the name Christian, you put yourself in basically this same position. When they receive you, they receive him. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. That's to say, Almighty God. Uh, in other words, our Heavenly Father is with you in that. And when someone receives you, they receive God himself. So you see how 
a person is worthy of his salt. With your presence comes the presence of God. I don't want anyone to get the big head about this or to be prideful. You would defeat every purpose for um, pride to lose the personal presence of the Holy Spirit. For wherever the Father and the Son are, there also dwell the Holy Spirit. 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now, you've heard me say a few times, I don't talk about tithing or support all that much, but you have heard me say that those that support the pastor receive uh, the same reward he does. In other words, you receive the same benefit because you are one body and you're a part of that ministry. And in supporting it, you receive that reward. Now, um, this, this has to do, I, I can give you a little more documentation on that thought, of the workers in the vineyard. I mean, there were some old boys who went out early in the morning and they started working in that vineyard through the heat and the sweat of the day. And he kept hiring people, the Lord of the vineyard. And finally he hired some people that were standing around at almost quitting time. And when it come payday, he paid them all the same. Thus documenting the statement here. You receive the same reward. I could even take that a little farther. Do you receive Paul? Do you support Paul? Do you support the teachings of Paul? We would not be all that, uh, we would not be out of line necessarily to say, if you carry on Paul's work, then you share equally with Paul. Think about that. Think about it. God is fair. God is good. And um, again, don't get on an ego trip. The Satan loves to toy with little old egos like Boy, doesn't that make me something? No, it doesn't. God gives us the gifts, and we share those gifts, and we use those gifts, but it is God that gets the glory. But you do receive that reward. Enough said, 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no way, no wise, lose his reward. Now, um, this verse is used by a con artist who um, claim to be preachers. You cannot refuse me. I must have this. I ask for it, and you cannot refuse it. You must. Hey, he, who is this written to? It's written, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, to the disciples that God is sending out, not some con artist. You don't have to give the enemy a drink of water. Well, you're supposed to love your enemies. That's true. You're supposed to love your children, and occasionally, if you don't correct the child, then you don't, that's not love. It works the same way with your enemy. If he's not corrected, in other words, if you give to a con artist wishes, a beggar in, uh, that's uh, in priest robes and is a con artist, if you give to his habit, rather than correcting him, rebuking him, then you become a partaker of his evil deeds. You share in that reward also. Be sure and share the water, which is the living water, a cup of the living water, with a legitimate disciple or student or pastor or teacher of God's Word. That's the subject. And what is the object? The object is that the vineyard grows tremendously because it is given to the true work of God rather than the enemy. In other words, it goes back to uh, verse um, 30, 
4, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. In other words, there's a war going on. And yes, then comes the peace. So you have enemies spiritually in, in this world. For Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And his spirit is here. And as uh, stipulated in uh, prior verses here, if you're being delivered up before him, just before the second advent, then certainly um, um, the conflict is very real and you don't help the enemy win his battle. You defeat him in the name of Yeshua. So take the instructions if you want God's blessings and follow them. Oh, but dear brother, you don't understand. This man came to my door and he was so sweet. He talked our church was just such a wonderful man. He never really got around to teaching the teachings of Jesus, but he was just a sweet man. Well, what was he good for? The only thing a preacher is good for is to preach God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. The only thing a pastor is fit for is tending the flock and feeding them with the Word of God. Otherwise, Friend, you don't have a pastor. Satan himself is one of the best preachers going. He knows more scripture than most preachers do. He documented that by tempting Christ himself with it in the fourth chapter of this same book of Matthew. There is a war on. It's a spiritual war. Be wise. That's what I'm saying. Love, yes. Love is to correct that that is wrong and set it aright whereby it can also enjoy the peace that someday will be when the true Prince of Peace comes to this earth. Chapter 11 and verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. He went to the cities of the Galileans, and he was going to teach there. Now, Again, I want to reemphasize these instructions are the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And when you go out, it is those things that you are supposed to observe. You are to teach all of God's Word, not just part of it. And you're not to deviate from it. Okay? I'm sure they didn't. But he's out on his own now. They're out in the field working. Verse 2. Now when John, and this would be John the Baptist, now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, verse 3, and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, it's, this can be misunderstood so easily. Who baptized Christ at Christ's own request? John did. What did John hear immediately after the baptism? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John wouldn't ask, is this Messiah? He knew he was Messiah. What John was asking, inasmuch as he was in prison, uh, and that was fine. His ministry was almost complete. But was, is this the advent, or do we look for another advent? For you see, John knew the scriptures as well. He was the last in that line of prophets before Christ. And he knew the scripture that foretold of the coming. John himself heard the voice of God declare the sonship. But John was beginning to get the idea, and you should also, that there would be two advents, not just one, as many at this time thought. Many thought, Messiah is here. Look at the miracles. We're going to be going into heaven soon. No, not so. And the old scriptures, the Old Testament, the old bottle, I will say, from the prior teaching of um, the Old and the New Bottle, the Old and the New Testament, the Old and the New Commandment, the Old and the New Will is even correct. That 
the old will in, in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, is first advent. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, is the second advent. You are told of both the first and the second advent in many places in the Old Testament. So I think it's important because many people misunderstand this. They feel that John lost courage or something that he would ask this question. He was asking, is this the advent or do we look for one to come? Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. He loved John. John was his cousin. Five. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. By who? The Savior, Messiah, had come at the first advent. He spoke of the war, but he's talking of the the mission of the, in Zechariah, in chapter 9, verse 9, first advent, he rides a lowly ass. That's why that he was fulfilling scripture when he rode that lowly ass in the, his entrance, one of them into the great city of Jerusalem. But in chapter, in verse 10, he rides a white steed, a stallion, and while well, it isn't implied the sex of the thing, but be that as it may. Uh, a mighty war horse, not, not that little uh, donkey, all right? Uh, verse 6, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed are those that shall not stumble at my teaching, but will understand the scriptures will understand the fulfillment of Almighty God's plan. John knew that. Was he saying, be patient, John? No, he was assuring John. You didn't have to be worried about good old John, all right? He was the man that stood out and cried, repent, repent. And when the Kenites came up, he called them what they were uh, and did it, it with class. All right, verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? That's a question. What did you go out there to see? Look, talk to John. A reed shaken with wind, with the wind? In other words, a figure of speech that means whichever way the wind blows, you'll believe that, and the next way it blows back that way, you'll believe something else. That's the, the traditions of men. Well, this brother, this dear reverend thinks so and so, and that dear reverend here, over here, he thinks something else. But what does the Word of God say? That's what's important. Not what some brother thinks. You must decide from the Word of God, for you shall be judged by it. Don't listen to every whim and every wind that blows in cross directions without stopping in the center and checking them out in the Word of God to separate the phonies from the real gifted teachers of God's Word. You didn't have to worry about old John. He didn't change. He had one message. Repent. Verse 8. But what went you out for to see? Question again. A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses and also in some churches. Oh, dear father, he's such an orderly person and he wears such fancy robes and clothing that it just takes my breath. He's such a sweet man. John wasn't called such a sweet man sometimes. And you know something? When Christ went into the temple and threw out the money changers and let those filthy, mite-infested doves loose, um, they didn't call him sweet that day. So you see, love practices all emotions, for love is the strongest force in the world. And if you love your father, you will do your father's bidding whatever the situation calls for, 
Verse 9. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. And again, well, let Christ tell us here, okay? Verse 10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, we're talking about Elijah. Elijah would uh, come. Elijah would prepare the way. Many people, because of their lack of uh, scholarship or whatever you would want to say, believe that John the Baptist was Elijah. He wasn't. I suppose they're not familiar with Luke chapter 1, verse 17. He came in the spirit of Elijah. He, Elijah would be asked in the book of John, are you, or, or Luke, are you that prophet? And he would say, no, N-O. But he was in that spirit, the spirit of Elijah that brings forth the truth, that turns the hearts of the children back to the true father and takes the enemy which follows Satan and turns their hearts back to that father. That's why in the last verses, of that great book, uh, Malachi, that it stipulates that Elijah would return just before the great day of the Lord, that is to say the one coming, and that the word would be taught and the hearts of the children would be turned back to the fathers, plural. Because there's two, there's a, there is a great controversy between Satan and God. Who do you listen to? I hope you would have been one that would have chose to listen to John even in his vivacious, vigor-filled addresses that would strip the hair right down from the nap of your neck if you got out of shape with him, but you would sure know how to get yourself right. That's real love. Verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. No flesh man, no flesh can enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, the, uh, he, your documentation, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, 50 or 51, somewhere right there. Um, there have been some, like Elijah himself was transformed as well as Enoch, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The forceful ones try to. Many have great difficulty with that particular verse, but Satan is in heaven. His fallen angels are in heaven. Your documentation, even to this day, they're going to be cast out. And this is why you will read in, in that great book of Revelation that when they are cast out, there is silence in heaven for a half an hour, which is half of the one hour period of temptation for us, understand. But the violence or the forceful ones are there. And the scripture from the great 11th chapter of Daniel should come to mind when it says they worship the God of force, the forceful one, the violent one. Who is he? Satan. They try to take it. They haven't got a prayer. Verse 13. Listen carefully. Think. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. John was the last in a line before Christ. Christ. I want to say that again. Listen to it carefully. John was the last in a long line of prophets before Christ was born of woman. 14, here is a deep thought. And if, now remember, if is a condition. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, this is Elijah, which was for to come, but 
did they receive it? Did they receive John? What are you saying? If they will receive me as Messiah, and if they will receive John as Elijah, then we are. But, of course, our Father knew the world would not receive them at that time. Why? Because it was the time of salvation. Immediately after the crucifixion, he would go back to that time to all those that died back to the time of Noah, which means from the beginning, to give them, inasmuch as God is righteous, to give them an opportunity to accept the Savior and be saved. Because they did not have the privilege of being a Christian as you are today, because Christ had not walked the earth and paid the price yet. They didn't receive him, so God's plan had to unfold as it was written. So, they didn't receive him, and the if applies. Verse 15, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. It's wonderful how Jesus used this terminology, that you that understand the word of God, you that do know, the difference between the spurious Messiah and the true Messiah. 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? The one that was right there. It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. 17. And saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. And we have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. What is Christ saying here? He's saying the emotions are all crossed up, like little children playing in the marketplace. I piped to you and wanted to play wedding, but you wouldn't dance. And then I piped again wanting to play funeral, but you wouldn't mourn. Not one tear was shed. You wouldn't play with me. So as though they are spiritually dead as far as ascertaining the movement of the Holy Spirit himself in generations whereby the actual events that would transpire such as the parable of the fig tree, all the other beautiful parables that you must understand to know and feel the emotion of Almighty God, the true emotion for the moment. How precious it was that he taught us through his doctrine how to feel that emotion, that touch of the true Holy Spirit. For you see, there is also the touch of an evil spirit. Some unfortunately, get confused, I suppose. Didn't know how to play, just like a bunch of children. Didn't know Messiah walked before them. Would not accept John or Messiah. Verse 18, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath the devil. And when he called the Kenites, ye generation of vipers, get out of my sight. <laughs> They didn't like John too much, and rightfully so. The Kenite shouldn't like John too much because he serves a different uh, uh, master. 19. The Son of Man, that is to say Jesus came, eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. And our people vindicate themselves by whatever they want to believe or by her children. They act like a bunch of children. They make up their minds like children, like children would be in power in, as we were told, in the end generations, even in the high government places, like little children telling fibs, little children telling lies. But people are too smart to believe lies. You see, the fact is, the emotion was this. Those that are biblically literate, that can understand, 
they know why that Christ was a friend to the publicans. But oh, the self-righteous hypocrites would squall and have a fit if someone gave a break to the little man, to the common man. And even to this day, they're like children. There's no emotion because they're not sure who's lying and who's telling the truth. It's real simple. Figure it out for yourself. But look at reality. We have an example. I don't know why I'm saying this, but we're saying it. A great debate about balancing a budget. Do you keep yours balanced? What happens if you don't? Do you get a little call from the bank, or do they just, you know, you get a call from whoever they bounce the check on? They're going to start bouncing all of ours. If something isn't done, because everything that goes up has got to come down. That's reality. Think about it. Like little children in the street. Wanted to play wedding and you wouldn't dance, you wouldn't laugh. Wanted to play funeral and you wouldn't cry. Be very wise in, these, in this end generation. Christ came as Savior. So naturally, how could he save a sinner if he didn't walk among the sinners? That's common sense. Okay? And poor old John, both of them, one being Elijah in spirit and the other a Messiah. And the people didn't receive them. They didn't know, like little children. Well, nothing is new under the sun. Think about it. We'll pick it up here in the next lecture. I do, uh, and um, listen a moment, won't you please?